Welcome to Pemplona, the city that inspired one of the greatest writers of the 20th century, Ernest Hemingway. Just like him, we will let ourselves be enchanted by the intoxicating atmosphere of this city, steeped in history and tradition. We will delve into the cobblestone streets, where the writer found inspiration for his iconic work, The Sun Also Rises. From its famous ferias, those famous bullfighting festivals, which take place every year from July 6th to 14th, to the lively bars where he enjoyed a glass of local wine, Hemingway's legacy remains alive in every corner of this charming city. And after exploring the historic streets of Pamplona, we will end our day heading towards another iconic destination in the Spanish Basque Country, Donostia San Sebastian. But for now, let's focus on Pamplona, where we discover the Puente de Magdalena, the most important of the four medieval bridges in the city, before heading to the city center for breakfast. The city center is a small maze of narrow winding streets, aligned with well-preserved medieval buildings. As Pamplona is a key stop on the pilgrimage route to Santiago, many pilgrims wander the streets of the city, and you can see the scallop shells, symbolic element often used to indicate the path of routes of pilgrimage leading to Santiago de Compostela. We pass by the town hall with its colorful baroque facade known for being the starting point of the Chupinazo, which marks the beginning of the Saint Fermin festivities every year, including the famous running of the bulls through the city streets. The streets of the city center are lined with buildings featuring colorful facades with wrought iron balconies, characteristic of Spanish architecture. We arrived at the Plaza Castillo, heart of the city and favorite spot of most of Pamplona's inhabitants. This square represents the transition between the old town and the modern city. And it's on this square that we will have our breakfast, and not just anywhere, as it is the Café Irunia, the writer's favorite place. The café is very touristy, but we are happy to be here, happy to discover this establishment, which has become the base camp in the novel, where people come every day to this historic establishment. It was a popular meeting place for intellectuals, artists, and influential figures of the city. It was also the first building in the city to be powered by electricity. The bar was inaugurated in July 1888 and in the early 20th century it was redesigned in the Art Nouveau style and even today it retains its same decoration from that era. We feel like we are in touch with literature history. And to quote Hemingway, we had coffee at the Ironia, sitting in comfortable wicker chairs facing the coolness of the arcade of the Grand Square. After this typically Spanish breakfast, we explore the square, surrounded by majestic buildings, with establishments as legendary as the Hotel La Perla, dating back to 1859, the oldest in Navarre, also frequented by Hemingway at the time. The square of the castle got its name because in 1308, a castle was built here. Around 1590, with the construction of the citadel, which we will soon discover, the castle was demolished. The square served as an arena from the 18th century and a fountain was built there, of which only the statue remains today. And finally, in 1943, the music kiosk was built. In 
It's often a gathering place for the residents and visitors of the city, offering a shaded spot to rest and relax. The place is the first place in the city that Ernest Hemingway visited when he arrived with his wife, Hadley Richardson, on July 6, 1923. We continue our tour of the city, discovering old buildings, the statue of Charles III, the sumptuous headquarters of the provincial institutions, which is neoclassical style from the 19th century, and the city theatre, featuring both national and international productions, as well as performances by local artists and theatre companies. And like Jack Barnes in Hemingway's famous novel, after taking a stroll in Pamplona, we come across the Cathedral of Santa Maria. And as the writer would say in his book, at the end of the street, we saw the cathedral and walked up toward it. The current cathedral is a Gothic temple that was built following the collapse of the Romanesque Cathedral in 1389. Its facade is in neoclassical style and was erected between 1784 and 1800. One thing is for sure, it's rather atypical. Its exterior columns are imposing and distinguish it from a traditional church. Inside the simplicity of the ribs, the large areas of bare wall give it the stripped-down appearance of Navarre's Gothic. In front of the ornate gate that closes the sanctuary stands the alabaster tomb commissioned in 1416 by King Charles III the Noble, founder of the cathedral, for himself and his wife Eleanor. But the highlight of the show is a bit further away, because unexpectedly, the church has a magnificent cloister located inside the cathedral complex. It's extremely well preserved. The cloister is a jewel of the Pamplona Cathedral and a good representation of Gothic style. It serves as a quiet space for contemplation and reflection. It features slender columns intricate tracery and ornate carvings characteristic of Gothic architecture. It's often praised for its elegant design and the quality of its craftsmanship, making it a must-see attraction for visitors interested in medieval architecture and history. The cloister of the Cathedral of Pamplona was built a century before the church itself between the late 13th century and the mid 14th century. We are facing one of the finest Gothic cloisters in all of Europe. Walking through the Pamplona cloister, one is immersed in a tranquil sanctuary, offering a serene escape from the lively cityscape. Walking on a steel carpet that serves as a guide with its dates and historical moments, we travel through the history of the West from classical antiquity to the present day. Religious artworks mark the passage of time or directly changes in liturgy. One can also see the refectory, which also served as a royal meeting hall and place of worship. Inside the complex, behind the cloister, we discover stained glass workshops, offering us a deeper understanding of the artistry and craftsmanship involved in creating these colorful masterpieces. We leave the church and head towards the Plaza de Toros and its famous arena. Built in 1922, 
which can accommodate 19,000 people. Here again, we find the traces of Hemingway with the statue placed near the arena. The visit starts in an original way as the film is projected on the three walls in front of us retracing the history and unfolding of this famous race through the streets of Pamplona. This projection allows us to feel what a bull run in the middle of the city is like. Pamplona now attracts around 1 million visitors for San Fermin festival every year, five times the number of inhabitants. And if there is a statue of Hemingway in front of the arena, it's because in his novel, The Sun Also Rises, Hemingway fictionalized his own travels through the Basque Country with a group of friends. The main action of the novel takes place around the festival in Pamplona. Hemingway brings to life his love for bullfighting and San Fermin for an audience not accustomed to such traditions. With millions of copies sold and a film adaptation in 1957, starring Tyrone Power, Ava Gardner and Errol Flynn, the international popularity of San Fermin has increased. Hemingway even dared to participate in bullfights during the 1924 festivities. And it's in this arena that we visit, where the race ends. You can also discover a map reproducing the route of the bull run when men dressed in white and red try to avoid them. We now head towards the citadel and pass through the Arasandi Park to admire the walls of Pamplona, a Renaissance gem. They are indeed very well preserved, stretching over 5 kilometers. One can then imagine all the battles and sieges they have witnessed since the 16th century when Pamplona became an outpost of the Castilian crown facing France. And yet, they are still there, as imposing as ever. It's not surprising that these walls have been declared a national monument We stroll along and enjoy panoramic views of the path that runs along the old town and the Taconera Gardens. Our walk 
thus leads to the citadel, another icon of the city. Classified as a national monument, it's considered one of the finest examples of Spanish Renaissance military architecture. Its construction was ordered by Philip II of Spain in 1571. And for those of us who have already discovered, during our visits, numerous citadels bearing the signature of Vauban, the famous military engineer of France under Louis XIV, we cannot help but think of him when we observe its architecture. And indeed, this reinforcement was carried out based on the project by Juan de Ledesma following the polyorcetic system known as the Dovoban. We stroll through the park and discover the Socorro Gate erected in 1689, shortly after the Ravelin, and it served to protect access to the city. The counterguard of Santa Isabel was the first access control for carriages coming from the countryside as they entered in the citadel. Counting the first control, visitors had to cross six bridges to enter the citadel, three fixed bridges, two draw bridges, and the last one, a tilting bridge, which allowed access to the third and final gate. Outside the fortress, you can walk in a huge park, which turns out to be very pleasant, both along the moats and on the side of Buelta del Castillo. We are now heading towards the last park before going to Saint Sebastian. And this is the Yamaguchi Park. Large oriental garden that pays homage to the Four Seasons and the Japanese city of Yamaguchi, twinned with Pemplona. Here, art merges with plants, trees, small houses, bridges and waterfalls. And if you have time, right next door is the Pemplona Planetarium with its large dome and galaxy garden, which is a vegetal replica of the Milky Way which has guided pilgrims on their way to Compostela for centuries. It won't be for us today, as we don't have time, but if you've been there, feel free to share your experience in the comments. We are now leaving Pemplona, and after a good hour's drive, we arrive at San Sebastian, but this will be for the next episode, so if you don't want to miss a visit of this true gem of the Basque Coast, subscribe and click on the bell to be notified. See you soon for new discoveries.